There were so many things, like I appeared fine, but there was so much wrong. I felt like everything had been taken away from me at that point. The sense of shock and loss was, it was like it created this complete decimation. So I basically felt a lot of guilt, a lot of emotions. They're just indescribable. I recognized things were different when I saw him become quiet. And I had to learn how to listen and surrender. And the only way for me as an athlete was if you take my body, then I'll listen. If you injure me, I will listen. Injuries or collapsing or, or, or exhaustion were the only way for me to check in. You have wounds in your emotional system and they affect your physical body after, after a while, but to such a strong extent that you can barely breathe. It's honestly like a tidal wave of depression. You know, it's very overwhelming. I started crying and uh, a, deep, a deep, just sort of dark, chilling feeling went over my body. I actually got goosebumps, I remember. And, uh, you know, and she just looked at me and I'm, I'm sorry, babe. It's just like, it's, that's the way shit is, you know. I wasn't eating, you know, I was losing weight. I had extreme anger because I felt the world was just against me and I felt that um, I had no support and so that brought on the anxiety. It was traumatic, it was similar to uh, what I imagine if somebody's in an electric chair waiting to be executed or waiting to be with the guillotine or being hung, you're just waiting any second that uh, your life is going to be extinguished. It was very difficult because I wanted to reach out to her and help her. I wanted someone to help her. I didn't exactly know what was wrong with her, but I knew she was hurting. My name is Scott Neal. I've served in the U.S. military for over 24 years. Many of those years have been within the special operations community. I've been in over 78 countries, mostly in the Middle East and within South America. I have four tours in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Africa. Today we are here to talk about post-traumatic growth. Well, commando forces are always it's sort of the, the pretty much the toughest, dirtiest jobs that no one else in the military touches. You know, 
eliminating targets, uh, various places where you know where they're not even supposed to be able to eliminate anyone, all kinds of things. So high high risk right? ventures really. I started uh, sports when I was six. I did judo. I fenced. I played all-star softball. I did karate, and then I rolled into kickboxing and made that my profession for uh, about ten years. Then I moved to America. And then I picked up uh, boxing. So overall, my combat career in the ring was 25 years. Well, I joined the Marine Corps uh, against my own will back in uh, December of 95. So 96, essentially. And just it was just an, an outlet to get out of uh, Los Angeles and that whole environment. Um, but you know, I realized I had nothing left for me in LA. Nothing was holding me back. So I just embraced it, went there from, to boot camp and, and moved forward. And I spent the better part of six years in the Marine Corps, uh, so essentially special forces work with the Marine Reconnaissance Units. I was a member of the uh, Austrian Commando Unit called the Art Commando, and then the French Foreign Legion, the Second Foreign Parachute Regiment, and also a commando unit in that unit. I also served in uh, private military companies. I used uh, goals to transform myself and to bring out the best in myself so you know from a national title to a european title to a world title another world title another world title so once i had four world titles uh, muay thai kickboxing wka and iska they're all different associations um, i hit a plateau and then i moved to america and then i set another goal i wanted to be world champion boxing and i wanted to be the best female fighter in the world so um, that I set out to do. You know, deployed, it was, it was a great environment. Uh, I was a, just a warrior at heart since a kid. Target! Hey, it is the Mexican, eating yeah, again. All all Finally, Sergeant Sanchez. What's up, Sergeant Sanchez? How come you're not number one, huh? Do you have anything to say for yourself? So it was, uh, it was an element uh, that I was very comfortable in. It was a heightened state of being the whole time, actually. It was something that, uh, it's hard to explain in words. It's something that you feel so alive, you feel so clear, you feel so tight with, all, with your comrades. You have closer relationships with these people than you have with your own brothers. Traumatic. Traumatic events affect not only the individual, but the community involved. Get out of the street, move back, get out of the street. The event. It could have been a one-time thing, but there are instances where it is a constant state of chaos. Constant conflict, much like what our soldiers, first responders, and civilians often experience. Traumatic events affect each one of us differently. Post-traumatic is every day after the traumatic event. It's how you see yourself, it's how you recover, how you deal with the memories, and how you deal with the emotions. Stress. Everybody has stress in their daily lives. Join the club. Learning to manage stress is the key to recovery. You must know how to control your anger and control your emotions. Know your red lines. Put yourself in a better environment. Learn how to help others help yourself. And finally, disorder. Disorder is allowing that stress and that emotion to build up, not knowing how to control it, not knowing how it affects your life. I've been exposed to it. I've learned to uh, appreciate the effects on the, on the person and, and the family and what that means how to deal with it. It's a helpless feeling, <clears throat> really. You don't understand until you really first recognize that it's, that it's happened, that something is different, something's changed in your, both in your child or in a friend. In a, in a social situation where normally he would um, be part of it and bubbly and exciting, but he just got quiet and withdrawn. You could see it in his face, in his eyes. You could see it in his sudden emotions when he would react to something too strongly. Once you recognize that something's changed and you can deal with it, but you have to be careful. You can't force it. You can't, they've got to want to, 
to be part of that in the need to change. Trauma is usually a very dynamic event. It shapes you, it molds you, it changes you not only physically, but mentally. Such as combat service, sports competition, serious injuries, accidents, personal assault, financial calamity, and profound personal loss. I was a police officer at LAPD, and June 3rd, 2006, I was working with my partner, Joe Meyer, and we were working Southwest Division, which is South Central Los Angeles. And Joe and I were um, working like a specialized enforcement unit, so we were out looking for people to stop before they uh, committed crimes, looking for guns, dope, and everything. And it was about 10.30 at night, we saw an individual that was you know, acting very suspicious, kind of screamed out to us like, hey, we need to stop this guy. I chase him and we have a pretty short foot pursuit, you know, maybe 40, 50 yards, and he runs up onto a porch of a fourplex and he's trying to get into a door. I don't know if this guy lives there or if he's breaking into somebody's house, but I know if he gets in that house and it, the situation is gonna be a lot more dangerous. So I grab onto him and I grab him up above the, like on top of the shoulders and I'm gonna rip him to the ground, you know, to handcuff him and find out why he's running. And at that point, he pulls out a gun from somewhere from his waistband or his pocket, I don't know, and it's a small little revolver and he fires one round under my left armpit. And of course, it's right above my bulletproof vest. And that round is a round that um, went into my T2 vertebrae, so, um, it was a paralyzing round. Heading out for a Saturday morning ride with a couple of friends of mine. Was uh, Went down the street to meet him out at the off-ramp from the freeway. I was going back to the house to pick up my fiance at the time and then head up the mountain. We were, we were supposed to go to the top, the top of, of the stratosphere. stratosphere but, but somebody uh, forgot the ticket. That... The tickets flew out of the window. <laughs> and they're non-refundable. <laughs> so A, buy the tickets again, or B, save something for the next time we come down here. And uh, en route back to the house, a uh, vehicle, I ran a stop sign and basically stopped right in front of me making an illegal left turn, uh, forcing me to go into sort of an invasive maneuver that I didn't pull off, went over the embankment and went on my back on some rocks and uh, basically went unconscious. My friend who had just been certified EMT came down, did the assessments, got me back to consciousness and um, we, we knew instantly that I had paralyzed myself. Here is the scene of the accident. Where that car just pulled out is a stop sign that the car didn't stop, and there's been several cars since I've been here that have just blown through that stop sign right there. So there's a stop. Here's the bush that you tried to grab onto, babe. Here's the sign that you took out. Down here is where you landed. Right through there that you came through. I'm pretty much standing right where your bike landed. And you flew off your bike to the right and landed right there. The lower rock is what landed on your back. This one right here. Um, yeah, I find the word post-traumatic stress syndrome a big word. I've had trauma because when you want to achieve in life, you have to push yourself beyond your own limits. And sometimes those limits are borderline abuse uh, for the mind and for the soul. A lot of pressure on her. She hung. She did well. She's a little bit nervous tonight. She forgot her boots. Sure. You know, it, uh, things happen. But uh, we just uh, now we, we've got to start here in America, and uh, we're gonna just shoot right up there. Uh, Next. <laughs> However, you will not know how far you can go unless you push those limits. So yes, I pushed those limits, and I pushed beyond those limits. And because I pushed beyond those limits, I also violated myself in many ways by overtraining, by exhaustion, dehydration. I was epileptic for a while in, uh, in my kickbox career because I overtrained and it was mentally and physically just too much for me at some point that I collapsed, literally. I was a reclusive artist living in New York City. It was unbelievable. I was hit at night, 60 miles an hour head on 
and the car um, caught on fire completely. I was trapped inside and nobody was around and I was conscious the entire time. It was, it was the most unbelievable thing. I remember being completely aware of what was happening and thinking, just in shock. Like, it was like being in a Hollywood movie and the fire just erupted around me like so fast and arms of flame in front of me and I, w I was just thinking I couldn't believe it was real. And you know, your whole life flashes before you in the midst of all this. And I realized very quickly that there was nobody around, not that I could see, and I was gonna need someone with the jaws of life to get me out of the car, so I knew I was gonna die. The police report considered it a homicide. They couldn't imagine me surviving. My face was so swollen I couldn't open my eyes. I felt deeply betrayed by life. Well, I went from multi-world champion and owning a great business that was doing well and thriving, house in Sausalito on the water, and my partner wanted me to buy his shares. I didn't want to buy his shares for that high of a price. He ended up taking me to court with lawyer's fees and things like that, and then um, got in another uh, court battle with the landlord who was not taking care of the facility that I was leasing. Lost a lot of money through that. Also, I had somebody that was purchasing my gym. I had owned it for 10 years. I wanted to move on. A uh, day after escrow, they had backed out, and so I had lost that. And during that time, um, my dog, who went to work with me every day, um, had developed cancer. She was my one stronghold. My boyfriend ended up cheating on me. You know, I had a big um, group of things as well as I had also drug tested positive in um, a competition. So it was my sports, my love life, my dog. My mom had a stroke through that period. It was just every step of the way I had something happen that I just felt like I couldn't even get a grasp of air. That's how it all started. Well, I was the victim of a home invasion robbery. I had an apartment on the third floor of a building, and uh, I was uh, watching TV. I walked into the, my, my kitchen to uh, get a glass of water, and a guy jumped out from behind the refrigerator with a, with a gun, stuck it to my head, uh, told me if I looked at him that he was going to kill me. And then he put me in handcuffs, maybe lie down at gunpoint, lie down face, uh, face on the carpet, and then he tied my legs up and he uh, proceeded to uh, psychologically torture me to try to get me to tell him where all my the valuable things in the apartment were. Like, if you tell me, I'll just kill you quick. But if you don't tell me, I'll torture you to death. But I didn't have anything to tell him. So I was just uh, terrified that at any moment, you know, he was going to slit my throat or uh, shoot me through the head or something, you know. It's almost like an out-of-body experience when it happens. You're not really there. You wish you weren't there. You wish it was you instead of your child because you feel guilty that you can't do anything about it when you're watching your child die. You're supposed to protect your children, and if you can't do anything about it, you feel like a failure. My parents were very young when they married. My mom was, gosh, like 16. And my dad was, I think, 18. So we're basically raised by children, and there was a lot of arguing and going to shelters, what battered women shelters. It was mostly emotional abuse. One of the major experiences was losing my son. Um, he was a premature baby and he had a lot of complications, so I ended up passing away. Well, I had a placenta abruption, which is a very rare thing. When the baby was born, uh, he had a grade three bleed in his brain. I was under a constant state of stress from a little baby and then that led up you know to the situation with my baby and it was just you know you're in hell you're living in hell when you watch your child die it's always very surprising the theory of being in war is very different from from the reality of it it's almost the first the first time a bullet flies by your head all the theory is out the window and you're left with uh, with the reality my uh, one of my main areas of operation was in was during the Balkan wars in Yugoslavia and there was a, a very big genocide that's a little overlooked by the, by the mass media, interestingly, population. The memory of that was 
why that hit so hard was because we came too late. We couldn't do anything in time about it. And all this, I mean, I have all this, the memory of, of all these faces, of all these corpses floating in my head always. I had that for a long time, you know, and I didn't know what to do with it. It's almost you feel this tremendous sense of guilt because you, you couldn't prevent it. Post-trauma. It is often said that soldiers do not think war is chaos. They think coming home is. Much like the days after 9-11, the country was traumatized. The firefighters, the soldiers, the first responders lived in a constant state of chaos. Recovering from your traumatic event is not only physical, but it is mental. Long after the body heals itself and recovers, the traumatic event lingers in the mind. With the medicines and technologies, you can adapt. You can overcome your physical limitations. But there's a darker side. It builds up pressure. The sights, the sounds, the memories can all trigger disorders and episodes. There's the mental space. I mean, this is just like the beginning of a very long journey of recovery, what burn patients go through. Every moment of every day for so long was about how do I survive the next second? Being in such shocking, relentless pain, you know, not being able to sleep 10 minutes at a time, the emotional, mental, spiritual part of it. I felt all my choices had been taken away. I felt like life turned its back on me. And so it just didn't make any sense, you know. And at that point, it was like the whole rug was ripped out from under me. But initially, I remember there was like this conscious separation of the mind and body. It seemed to shut off feelings and, and emotions. And I think it's really healthy, like it's a survival mechanism, you know, so you can get through a tough time. But I noticed initially I didn't want to feel. Then when I started to feel, and I started to realize what had happened, and I felt the betrayal that I felt from life. And all of a sudden, anger started creeping in. And there was this feeling of, of, of fear of feeling. You know, I started to feel like if I let myself go into this, I may never come out of it. I may never, it's going to take control of me. So it's natural to feel that way. But what I realized very quickly was I needed to find a way to release all of that emotion out of my physical being. Holding on to it, like repressing sadness or anger or rage or betrayal, all those things, if you hold it in, it starts to contort and distort how you feel and walk in the world and, and repressing it like creates anger in your body. And so I remember just trying to slowly start the process of releasing it out of my physical being. And oh my gosh, it's such an unattractive process, you know, going through all of that. It's sloppy and it's messy, but once you do it, it's just, it's out of you. And it's like, you're free. The symptoms of PTSD that I, that I had were so many fold. It's almost, it's gonna take me an hour to, <laughs> to tell you all of them. It started with it. Basically, the, the fear is, is the most fear and physical exhaustion, and I couldn't leave my bed. I, could, I made it into my bed because I, had, I, had, I was terrified of, of making it to the bathroom. I still don't know why these particular details hit so hard. But I mean, your emotions have such a strong physical connection. I had so much anxiety, and usually I wasn't anxious to the point where I was going three, four days without sleeping. Within six months had totaled two of my cars falling asleep on the highway. So I, in many ways I was lucky, but there were so many signs and nobody had told me I had um, post-traumatic stress or anything was going on. I started getting depressed also. Panic disorder generally, it leads to depression because you know I tried to talk to some counselors and stuff and friends, like girlfriends and stuff, and 
uh, they kind of don't understand. They say, well, just get over it already. Or if you're depressed, the worst thing you could say to a person is, just cheer up, you know? There was one particular day I remember where I was sitting in my living room and it was just a few weeks after I got home from the hospital and my mom was cooking something on the stove. It was a hot, oily pan and she must have put something in the pan that was very wet or something and it created this loud crackling sound, like dramatic sound that I had forgotten was a sound in the car and it threw me into such an emotional moment of almost started a flashback, like of remembering I had no control. It was like it threw me back into that moment. There's, there's certain things that um, it's hard to pull together because there was, there was so much that happened in over a long time. And it's hard to remember a lot of things uh, because things are better for her now. But I saw her losing all interest in everything that she had loved before. Um, she had loved photography, she loved working out, she loved kickboxing, she loved school. She, um, all her passions seemed to leave. She didn't want to get up in the morning, she didn't want to come home at night. She just wanted to, to keep running, keep going. And her anger, she had a lot of anger. Uh, and didn't know how to direct it. and. Um, directed a lot of it inward to where she was self-destructive. She was very fearful, very anxious, always afraid and not knowing what she was afraid of, um, wanting to die. 100% uh, vulnerability and helplessness. Just general distrust and every time I would go into my house, I would have all the windows shut and all the door and make sure they're all locked, and make sure all the doors are always locked at all times. If something hurts you, your natural tendency is, is to stay away from it. And that's sort of your own thoughts and your own inner feelings are hurting you. So you're trying to, to push them away, but that doesn't work. They, can, they become strong and they haunt you even more. So that all this needs, needs to be faced little by little. You feel like you're going to go crazy, let's put it that way. You feel so alone. Um, you feel like you're the only person that's going through it, although you're not because there's a lot of people that go through losses all the time. But at that time, you feel so alone. You're your worst enemy. I, I didn't know who Sarah was, and I really didn't want to be Sarah. I didn't want to be me. I kind of hated myself for a while, which is really sad to hate yourself, because you give off that energy, and people pick up on it, and then bad things start happening, because that energy just creates a lot of negativity around you. And then after that situation, I started self-medicating alcohol, um, getting into really bad relationships, unhealthy relationships, because that's what I was drawn to which caused even more stress. Being in unhealthy relationships, arguing, doing revengeful things to each other, negative, terrible, terrible things. I feel like there was a circus going on in my head. I could even hear like noise that wasn't there. Just constant noise in my head. Constant thinking, constant overanalyzing, constant feeling, feeling insecurities, almost paranoid. Um, like I remember being uh, at a dinner table with my friend and his, his family members in like a circular dinner table and they were having a great time, but I just felt disconnected, like I wasn't part of it. And plus the fact that they got along so well and they were such a great family, it gave me anxiety because it made me feel bad about my family. So I started analyzing that situation in my head, started breathing hard, and my heart started palpitating. It felt like I was gonna have a heart attack. I told my friend's mother what was going on, and she just she she's a psychologist and she just didn't understand it. She goes, I don't know, I don't know why this setting would trigger that. It doesn't, it doesn't explain anything because I've never been in a situation where I, you know, someone was trying to follow me or kill me, but I always felt like something bad was going to happen to me. And that's when the anxiety attacks got out of control because I felt, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And it was like just an extreme feeling that I was going to die. My life was surrounded in darkness for a long time. It's been a long journey. Those things were, were more and more apparent each time he was exposed to the, to the combat situations he was in, not the way... Uh, he had been when he left. There's an awful lot of, of different nuances to that. If, if you've, you've lost a child, uh, it's the helplessness. It's the same thing you feel in any situation. You, you're helpless. You can't change what happened. It's, it, it's, it's there. One doesn't recognize that when, when, when you're shocked, really, there's acute trauma, which is 
probably the first month or so, and then everything afterwards is post-trauma. And if it hits you two years afterwards, you don't really recognize the shock anymore, or the whole, the whole experience as a shock. But the, the shock is still stuck in your system, so it's very difficult to recognize. Also, when I was in the state, I always thought it was tomorrow will be better. Something will turn around. I'm a good person. I paid my dues. Somebody's going to realize all this wrong has happened to me. The lawsuits are going to be overturned. You know, I felt like there was a lot of things that were going to happen. And when they didn't happen, all the anger came out. It was being a victim, but as well, just very angry. Were little things like, for example, if somebody comes up behind me, even today, and uh, just taps me on the shoulder. You know, I just jump, you know, like it, it, it freaks me out to be surprised because I guess it triggers that feeling of when the guy stuck the gun in my face. I had a girlfriend once, she didn't know, and uh, she came up behind me once. I was sitting out at a restaurant or something. She put her hands over my eyes from, from behind and said, Guess who? <laughs> that's, a, you know, that's an old joke that a lot of people do, but kind of freaked me out. <laughs> I said, please don't do that, because, you know, I don't like being surprised anymore. The spinal cord injury was life-changing for sure. It instantly, you know, changed my world, just turned my world upside down, fundamentally affected pretty much every aspect of my life. I was like an infant in my body now, and um, I was totally, I was lying in the hospital, like, how am I going to go on now? How am I gonna live my life like this? You know, I had no idea how I was gonna get through it. Initially, when I was in the hospital in a catastrophic injury, a trauma like that, you're on all these amazing drugs that make you feel like, oh, okay, I'm paralyzed. And it, it does not sink in at all. So people told me, my husband told me, you know, I was paralyzed and I was like, okay, you know. But then once they take you off all that stuff, you know, I was, very depressed and sad and you know I ha had to like you know how they say take things one day at a time you know sometimes it would be you know one hour at a time sometimes one minute and you know sometimes one second at a time and not get overwhelmed with thinking if I started to think too much about like into the future and even that could be the next day or you know the next week how am I going to deal with this it would get overwhelming, so I had to just like really live in the moment and handle the moment, you know, as it came. Do you want me to video? Just wanted to get the initial one started. Okay, can you hold yourself? Yeah, I, I am holding him. Wait, but we don't want the legs to flop down here. No, are you videoing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, that hip didn't come till after a surgery where they took the bone. I saw the graft. Yeah. Ooh, beautiful. Wow. Beautiful. The first time I can really remember starting to sort of reflect and, and getting some time to when things sort of started leveling out and I was off the painkillers and I had a sort of a coherent uh, thought process was I was laying in the hospital, I was already in the ICU and, and going through the, uh, recovery at the and PT and therapy at, at the hospital um, and the wife at the time, had, uh, we were laying just sitting around killing time, asked me to wiggle my toes and they're always like, you know, try to move your feet, try to do this and that and you never really give it much thought, oh I can't, I'm paralyzed, you know, and, and it just, you move forward and that's it. But in this moment, it, it, we were just hanging out watching a movie and she'd, she'd asked me to try to wiggle my toes and it just all of a sudden it just came to my light and hit me like, you know, a brick wall that this particular time, for whatever you know, scenarios or the circumstances, it just, you know, I can't wiggle my toes, and I started crying. Oh yeah, babe, you're working it too much now. I'll slow it down for you. Do a wheelie. When you go through a, uh, a time where you're challenged, either physically or emotionally, um, depending on what age, I was young at that time. I was frustrated because I wanted what I wanted. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to keep up with the boys. There were these strenuous trainings. If I didn't know where I was going, I would be out. I could, I could not deal with it. Your environment are people who've been abused, so are used to abuse. It becomes normal. Uh, suck it up, whatever. But we have to protect ourselves as a, as a human being. Your environment is, they want you to win. Results, results. Your fans, they want you to win. A boxer does whatever to become a champion. It's very addictive. It, it's very addictive because 
you get used to the attention, um, your uh, performance today is your self-worth. You're bad, you're bad, you're good, you're great in the ring. Uh, so if you stop doing, um, stop being good, then you think you're worthless. And, and you, the attention gets less, you think that you're unloved. You know, the, 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 the high stopped working. At one point, I remember after a fight, I won the same evening at Calm Down and think, okay, and now what? <laughs> That's it, exactly. Get it up there and hold it. Good, now bring it back down. Excellent. What are you working on? Nothing. I told you I wasn't going to talk to the camera. Look here. Look here. Nope, I'm smiling for the camera. Come on. Nope, nope. Really good shot of your face. What? What'd you wish for? Can't say that it won't come true. You already blew out the candles and I didn't even have it on video. Oh, I got excited. <laughs> What's three? I'm three years old? No, you know what three I is. I couldn't even function in, in normal society anymore. I didn't know what to do. And it was nightmares and you, you can't sleep and you can't you start sweating in in most normal family situations. You, you start to sweat and you start to get angry. It even extends into the physical, you know, I start beating up people. And things. Just for something that they that they said that you didn't like, you know, minor stuff like that. It was always uh, at a hair trigger, really. It almost like a whole body of a whole body of anger was was released at a, at a hair trigger. Disorder is the lingering effects of the traumatic event. Does it shape your life? Does it make you scared? You wander around, you're aimless. Without the proper guidance and direction, it's easy to get confused. I like to use the analogy of the tunnel. There's a beginning and an end. It's often very dark. Sometimes you don't even know that you're inside the tunnel. The tunnel which keeps you trapped, keeps you confined. Coming out of the tunnel is easy once you discover that you're actually stuck. Recovery is also like coming out of the tunnel. Once you understand what's affecting you, once you understand the disorder, once you understand the mental space that you're in, walking out of the tunnel becomes easier every day. Learning to grow from your experiences and your traumatic events is the first step to coming out of the tunnel. I woke up one day and I realized that I'd come to this place of such a complete sense of healing inside of my entire being, of feeling so peaceful. I felt like I was carrying this secret about life, about how to navigate out of pain, about how to overcome obstacles, how to, to find your way to your heart's desire and to a life that's beautiful. I've come to such a good place after so many years. It has become tremendously important to me to help those people still stuck in these dark places. It was in my own life, it was just a complete, complete accident actually that I found my way out of it one step at a time. I made it a priority in my life to help those still suffering from it. It was so powerful, this feeling, that I actually made a decision to put my art brushes down and come out from behind my easel and from a somewhat secluded life that I've had to share everything that I've learned about life. I feel like I want to share with people this incredible message of, of hope.
think one of the most important things that I learned in all this was no one ever told me this, but when right when an incident has happened, the most important thing that a person needs to do is to stop everything. Just you completely, I call it hitting the pause button, and you literally drop everything in your life, and you just, you assess where you are, and you absorb the shock of what's happened to you, and you give yourself that time to like assess your wounds, and see where you are, and get your bearings, and give yourself that time to take it in. It's like you don't have to do anything, you just be. And this is like where true grieving happens and true sorrow is there. And no one can ever say you're, you're indulging or having pity on yourself. I mean, it's impossible. This is where it's like you get your bearings and you realize, okay, this is what's happened. This is where I am so that you can move forward. To me, I mean, that is the most essential part that had to happen before I could do anything. I could never have taken action. It wouldn't have been appropriate or possible for me without having done that. Time's important. Uh, it gives you a chance to, to learn new things, to, to realize that the situation that happened, and put it in perspective. Because I found like when people were in the beginning telling me, oh, you should do this and you should do that, and I, I became very agitated. When things first happen, you don't have perspective of what it is. It's so immediate. It, it happened to you. It happened right then. And it's because I hadn't given myself that time yet. To realize that it isn't the end. It's the beginning. Learning how to listen to my instincts, I actually had to relearn boundaries, relearn feeling what was right for me and do it based on feeling, not on what I was taught or the rules of the environment, but more on what felt right to me. So in the beginning, that was a challenge, but I would pay the price with a seizure if I would not listen. So that was the first time that I came in touch with, hey, there's an inner voice here that's screaming out and I had to learn to listen. In that first phase where you're kind of accepting, you're in acceptance, you're, you're really go, taking in what's happened to you and giving yourself, like honoring yourself for the situation you're in, giving yourself that time and space. And initially you might not be able to feel feelings. Sometimes, you know, in the very beginning you can't feel, it's too hard to do and that's okay, it's like a natural part of the process. But you wanna to work towards feeling the emotions that are there, because otherwise they're gonna stay repressed. Writing about my experiences, just from the top, like, with no purpose, just by writing it down, just to almost, just to be able to digest it. Because all this stuff was so confusing, all these images were so confusing, and they were so not connected, and just always in present in my, in my mind or in the back of my mind. I did a lot of journaling, and in the journaling, I learned to understand why do I need to go in the ring every three months to feel alive? Everything, put it all together now, okay? Good job, good job. Deep breath. Through the journaling, I understood that I was wounded as a child and that my drive was anger and frustration and um, a loss of self. Um, so I wanted to be acknowledged and through fame and uh, literally beating up people I got attention and I got uh, acknowledgement. I had this feeling of really of well-being for the first time in, in years. I must say it was the most difficult thing like the first time I was writing in, in, a, in a notebook with a pen and I found myself holding the pen with my fist and really grinding down. <laughs> I still remember that, I still remember that moment, without even realizing that I was doing that. I really forced myself to relax and to, to write like one word, one little sentence after the other, until it, until it felt easier and easier. One, one also, one, one tends to, or I, I tended to not even, I, I never wanted to think about these issues really. They were haunting me, but I, I never wanted to consciously think about it, or work with it, or, or look at them, because I didn't know, I was so confused, I didn't know what to do with it all. And the writing really helped that relive that in a, in a, almost with a little distance, with a little cushion to it. And so, and I did that with, uh, you know, some, some of the, the hardest stuff I did it many times, and it, it became easier and easier, more 
almost just finding finding its right place in my memories and the emotions connected to it. Oh, okay. I'm glad actually you're reminding me of something. So uh, engaging your physical body is one of the most transformative tools because okay like our physical body is like our vehicle right it's how our heart and our mind navigates through the world it's so easy to forget the power of the body and what i found was i was very limited in my movement and my ability to move for so long but the day that my physical therapist came to me and she said allison she's like you're ready i need to take you out on the mountain we were in colorado and she took me out skiing on the mountain and I was terrified because I was so worried I was going to get hurt more than I already was. But what happened to me was I went from one minute feeling like I was disabled and, and hunched over and limited and living in a box and feeling like I couldn't do to the next thing you know I'm flying down the mountain and it, it shifted everything. It had this ripple effect into every area of my life. I suddenly felt, I mean I hadn't laughed that hard or smiled that much in months since the accident and I suddenly realized oh wait there is so much more like I can do I can be social I can reconnect I get to be in the world it was an absolute fast path to shifting my entire paradigm okay we're recording <laughs> awesome actually right and we've got a triathlete in the picture this is great this is a good picture right there I can't necessarily say there was a methodical process. I know when that turning point, when that process began, and that was uh, essentially I'd, I'd met, befriended two individuals in the hospital that had a very similar, identical injury as mine. Uh, both had better prognosis, had use of their toes, and can, you know, uh, had ambulatory, you know, po possibilities early on. Um, both had committed suicide within a month of each other after we exited the hospital. And it was really at that point that it was just, you know, a reality. It's like, hey, man, you need to do something about your life. Because at that point, all three of us were just hanging around the house, playing video games and doing a whole lot of nothing because we weren't mobile enough to even leave the house. A day in the life, huh, babe? You know. <laughs> this is the excitement for the day. It's not. Um, you know, my wife at the time was working eight-hour days at that point, so... My only social contact, for the most part, was when she got home, and usually it was just bitter, you know, mo moaning and depression and whatnot. So, what are you doing here? It's our anniversary. Yeah, but what are you doing here? What do you mean? What am I doing here? Why didn't you answer the phone? Uh huh. This thing looks very, very peculiar. Yeah. Why do I have to be on the spot? You want me to turn the camera off? How come you didn't call and answer the phone? What do you mean? You have somebody call so I can rush you in here? No, the phone just started ringing just as you were outside. Alright, that wasn't very graceful, so I'm going to go outside and do that again. Okay. Quitting was never an option, so she came up with the idea that you got to go to school and I was huge, huge in opposition to that because I was just really insecure about being able to succeed in, in college. Because um, I never succeeded in school prior to that, you know, K through 12 was just, uh, it was just a phase, you know, and I always got pushed through school because I was never really there or paying attention. Uh, so it was a scary, you know, thought, but it was something that I was open to because hanging around the house wasn't, wasn't working out and it wasn't going to work out for a long-term plan. And I'm a, I'm a bit of a planner and I like setting goals. That brings me to the next thing. When it's appropriate and when you're ready, finding something that, that you want to plan or move towards in, your, in the next part of your life is so important. It's like feeling useful, feeling like you have a purpose, feeling like there's something that you can start to dream about, having hopes and dreams. I mean, these things start to move you beyond um, the attachment, which is so powerful, of, of an incident. I started going to school and, you know, got little success stories early on, started getting A's, and I was a straight-A student uh, through community college, first two years of college and then transferred into a university and ended up graduating with a bachelor's. So it was the successes within school that really started uh, getting my self-esteem back up because, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the, the theme that you get when you break your back or have a, a catastrophic significant injury where your mobility is significantly impaired is sort of get used to a simpler life and 
uh, the doctors, you know, usually are telling you what you're not going to be able to do versus what you are going to be able to do. And they sort of start, set you up for a low standard so that when you may or may not uh, achieve that, it's not too much of a disappointment because you're already dealing with enough depression, right? It gave me a focus. Even though I couldn't accomplish anything else in my life and everything was falling apart, I was able to say, okay, I'm going to be the world record holder in the squat or the world record holder in the deadlift. And it just gave me one little aspect of my life that I could control and really focus on and do every single day. My life changed. I didn't just fight with anger to hurt someone and to build a sense of self. I fought for a purpose. And the purpose for me at first um, was to show women can fight, to empower women. If you think you can't, I know you can because I can too. In that goal setting, I also transformed my understanding of why I wanted what I wanted, what drove me to do what I did. Once I started realizing school wasn't as difficult as it was, and I started getting that little uh, insecurities and self-esteem back that I could achieve in college, I started like, well, man, maybe I can venture out into other things in, uh, in life, and that's when I bumped into hand cycling. For me, the steps to pull myself out of this situation were, like I said, when I was in the hospital, I didn't know how I was going to deal with it, so let me get out of here and start going to the gym and working out. I knew that like, I needed to stay active. Physical exercise, another very, very important thing. Physical exercise was so, was so tremendously helpful. As soon as I was able to function a little bit physically again, I took to exercising. It, was always, it, relieved, so much, it relieved so much of the stress. Seven days a week I was going to the gym for three hours a day and giving myself that. It would make me feel proud. I would say to myself, even though I've got all this going on, I still have the discipline to be able to do one thing in my life and do it well and not say, oh, I'm tired today or, oh, I want to go home and watch Family Guy or something. I would take that, that effort and time to really make sure that I did that each and every day. And it gave me some substance as well. It gave me some linear, some reason to um, get ready and to, you know, um, brush my hair and go on, you know. Diet and exercise play a big role also. If I drink like too much coffee or eat sugary junk foods, it makes me edgy and uh, nervous. So I try to avoid uh, stimulants. Take vitamins, minerals, try to eat a healthy diet as much as possible. Contact with nature, because I grew up in the Austrian Alps, and that's where I spent these years afterwards as well. Contact with nature, with uh, farm animals and things like that, it was very, very soothing. Anything that was so, almost like what, what would help a little kid to feel happy, you know? Just be with the elements, I think, was a huge connection to the universe and made me feel small in a way that was good, like my problems weren't that big because there's a huge ocean out here and there's a dolphin going by me and that wave was great that I just caught. My husband and I, we were very active before the injury. We liked to surf and snowboard and fish and he wanted to get us right back into that lifestyle. He didn't want this to have to change everything. And so he started adapting a lot of our hobbies that we had done before. And so immediately, I think two weeks out after I got out of the hospital, we took a bunch of friends out and we went out surfing. And we had seen it on a movie, a quadriplegic surfer. So we figured we could kind of mimic the same thing. And Well, it's been a long journey, a long journey, I feel. The steps I have taken to get over my anxiety, my, my panic attacks, my stress, number one is developing a sense of humor. And the lifeguards were like, what are you guys doing? And we were like, well, we really don't know, but you might want to stick around. And I just have a really great sense of humor. I love to make people laugh. I love to engage in funny, 
dialogue. There's an old saying, uh, laughter is the best medicine. Try to find something to make you laugh, either a movie or TV show or, a, you know, stand-up comedy or whatever. I think it really does change your brain chemistry when you laugh and it puts you at ease and relaxed. It's better than uh, psychiatric drugs, I think. Don't be afraid to ask for help. There are a lot of resources out there that, and people that are totally willing and want to help you. I think it's totally normal and it's only going to help you push past it. If you're in an environment of a person that lifts you, be around them more often. Hang with them. Hang with people that lift you. Uh, associate yourself with a group of people that look at the solution, not the problem. Find somebody that you do look up to because you're likely going to be more open to their advice and suggestions and mentoring and, and try to connect with those people. Develop a base of uh, you know, a s several individuals, I would say. When I heard stories of people that changed their lives, it inspired me to change mine because I felt if they can do it, I can do it. So that helps to surround yourself with people who stand in the solution, who think positive, who've done their work or are willing to do the work and not isolate. That's so important not to lock yourself in your room. It's like you find your support system and you learn who you can go to and not everyone's gonna know how and it's not their fault, you know, they just don't know how to do it, but you find who you can go to. Great friends, people that support you, people that you feel like you have something in common with. Doing things for other people, so whether it was working at the needle exchange program or going and uh, working with animals, it allowed me to see that people were much worse off than I was. Also giving them the attention and putting my love towards them really took off what I was going through and made me smile and made me have a better day. And you bathe yourself in the love and compassion from these people and then you learn to receive and you learn to give that love and compassion to yourself. And this is something that calms your whole nervous system down little by little by little. Well, sure enough, you know, I didn't even know if I could swim yet at that point, you know, and he put me on a board and a couple guys paddled me out and pushed me into some waves. And, but it was really emotionally healing because it was, I felt this huge sense of independence and freedom come back with that and like, all right, I can still do a lot of things that I enjoyed doing before and I can do those now. So even though I'm gonna have to kind of change stuff, I can still find a lot of, of that fulfillment. Friends and family are an immediate resource. Speak your name and uh, relationship to the owner of this camera. Uh, I am Jose Isabel Nagera Jr. Uh, I am your uncle. They knew the old Jew. As they reach out to you, they extend the hand, they pull you forward to the light. Don't shut them out of your lives. Traumatic events not only affect yourself, but they affect your friends and family. It is through personal growth that you learn to overcome. It's with your family members and your loved ones that you learn to come out of the tunnel. Sometimes they lack the understanding, but they always have the compassion. But they are prepared to help you, to help guide you through growth, to be there on the other side. It's important that we grow from this experience and we learn to adapt. And there's good news for sufferers. There's a way back. There's a way back to a better life, to your family, to your loved ones, to a happy, productive self. Resiliency is the key. I'm very excited about this next speaker. Without any further ado, Allison Masari. I was a reclusive artist living in New York City. And one day I came home to an eccentric voicemail. The Russian voice said, Natasha, you must be prepared to meet your team of operatives at midnight tonight at the Brooklyn Bridge. I will send you precise meeting coordinates and encrypted code. <laughs> That was my father. <laughs> For two years, we'd been playing this very elaborate game pretending to be Russian secret agents. We were always trying to one-up each other in clever spy talk. 
As you heard, my alias was Natasha. I imagined myself with long black hair and high black boots. Very dangerous. <laughs> Natasha! Be very careful when you start your car. Natasha was not just dangerous. She was an agent who'd frequently saved the world from impending doom. But then came the day that all joking stopped. One of, I mean, the most difficult things is when you have a physical um, scar or when people can see that something's happened to you and it frightens them. It's, there's like a cellular response that humans have and it's fear for their survival. And it creates in people, even people who knew me, I mean, anybody from a stranger to every socioeconomic level, every education level, across the board, people would sometimes say things, and it didn't make them bad, but they, I could see that they were afraid. If they looked at me and they saw burns all over my body, you know, 300 staples in my back, and they're thinking, wow, if this could happen to her, could it happen to me? And something happens to people and it's like they can't help themselves sometimes. They say things that are hurtful. And, you know, this happened so many times when I would go out into the world and it was devastating. I mean, the pain that I felt, I started to feel like I would always have to live on the fringe of society, that I would never be accepted into normal society. I really believed that I'd been assigned to a diminished life because of how I was treated when people could see me. Well, for one thing, I know my family had a much, I don't know, it's, it's, I suppose it's relative, but I would say much more difficult time with my injury because... There was no guidelines. Nobody, and PTSD, in, my, in, in that time, PTSD didn't even exist. The label didn't even exist. It was just all of a sudden you're completely messed up and you have no idea why and everybody around you is sort of asking what's wrong with you and you don't know and they don't know and you know. I think with family members too, just as it is with the person that's affected, the family has to, they need help. My family didn't know what to do with it. I mean, I had to go back home, live with my family and my, they had no, no idea what to do with it. I, I wasn't quite sure what, to, what I could do for her. I just know that I needed to be there for her. She needed someone there. My mom was torn apart. I felt like I couldn't, leave her side, I felt like I had to be there for her. And it was really frustrating, especially when she was getting into trouble and I would talk to her and, and, and try to tell her to, to um, what, what would be better for her health, what would be better to do, but uh, she wouldn't do it. For them to not shut down and draw help from their friends, from their support network, because if you try to, you can often be overwhelmed with it as a close family member and try to take on too much and trying to trying to always be there you know for the person that's affected by it is very important but you need your own help as well I started having a lot of anxiety and depression because of this because um, I felt like I couldn't help her it was very difficult for them and they would hold it they actually uh, when they'd come around they'd, they'd hold it together because most of the women to include my mother especially and my aunts uh, would just always break down and cry whenever the, the, the mention of me and my circumstances hey, you know, whenever that subject had come up, they'd come and they'd you know, visit me in the hospital and they'd, they'd keep it together. They'd be as strong for me because they didn't want to show that, you know, he's got enough to deal with. We don't need to be, you know, weeping in front of him kind of thing. I thought I had lost her. I thought she had, she had lost herself. And you can't always be the giving, giving, giving. You need support as well. So I think drawing support from, there's a lot of support groups out there, you know, and from your close friends and family and stuff and realizing that you need that help as well. So it's been kind of an ongoing struggle just to uh, friends and family to, uh, for them to understand that uh, I can't just cheer up or, or just calm down if I feel like anxious. Uh, I, need, uh, I need to be treated a little bit uh, carefully that, in that way. I don't have like a thick skin like I used to or like most people do. I'm very sensitive, I guess is the way to put it, about uh, things. I'm still working on it. With respect to my family, when I was in that situation, they um, tried to help me as much as they could, but I didn't talk to them very much, and I didn't want to let them know uh, that I had failed in many different areas of my life. So I really um, tried to keep them from what was going on. Naturally, when we're not 
well versed in a scenario, we go into these extreme hypotheticals. So they just got into, well, while wow, Miho is paralyzed and he's gonna be in a wheelchair from now on and he'll never be independent again and he'll never live a normal life. Best intentions and everything and you know, they had their role in, uh, in my recovery and everything and definitely were, were as much support as, as they can be and I would allow them to be. But um, it was just, you know, the, the worst case scenario and, and rightfully so and honestly they weren't ever too far from the truth um, but you know, unexpectedly nobody really saw me bouncing back from that as, uh, as, know, as well as I have. What you're about to see is something that's very important to me, as you know, and I guess I want to apologize for not doing this sooner. Um, I tried to explain why, and I hope you understand. I wish you could be here for this. Um, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but you're going to get the finished product, whether it's good or bad, just so you have something. Uh, I hope you like it. I love you. Um, I made a, a, a huge mistake of because uh, I had a lot of pride. I was very prideful, and still I'm a very prideful individual. Uh, stubborn. I'm not, I would say I'm not as stubborn anymore. I've learned from my lessons, but I cocooned everybody out of my life. And the way I saw it is, if you didn't have a spinal cord injury and deal with paralysis, you really had nothing to offer me. Um, so I wouldn't let you in my world. So basically, instead of creating a good support network and finding, uh, you know, uh, mentors and advocates that that could help me sort of uh, deal and look forward and keep focused, you know, and stay positive uh, in life. Yes, there's always a certain level of depression when you deal with such uh, such injuries. But uh, I did the exact opposite. I, I shut everybody out to, to include my wife at the time. And eventually she got to the point where she couldn't, I wouldn't allow her to help me. And um, she sought professional counseling. The counselor said, you guys need to leave apart for a while. And, uh, you know, maybe re, you know, go find yourself, get yourself back on your feet, emotionally speaking. And uh, maybe I'll be at that point ready to try to, work on the relationship but instead of doing that I said you walk out that door um, you're never walking back in again and you know she followed through and you know again too much pride so basically at this point I was alone and uh, and that's in one way that's the way I wanted it but in another way that uh, that let me go into a pretty dark area that uh, I didn't need to go I could have circumvented some of those steps but you know again you live and you learn right well um, it's been kind of I have a missing link in my life is uh I don't really have, I, I've had some girlfriends when I was younger, but I think it helps to have, you know, some uh, loving, compassionate relationship in your life, you know, with someone, someone to nurture you emotionally. I think it's a very healing thing. And... Well, I think I grew in the process because she was also a help to me. When she would learn something or feel something in her life that was a positive, she would share it with me. And it would not only help her, but it would help me. So she was also giving to me many times. That in itself, I can't say I'd want to go through that again, but it was, a, it was a savior for me also. I knew I had the support of my family, but I wasn't used to having anybody help me in any way because I was so righteous and was going to do it on my own that I didn't allow people to help me. My family, um, what they went through, I think watching the whole process was so deeply painful and shocking for them. Like I can't even, I don't even think I have any idea of what it did to them. I mean, they, I, I'm certain that they had post-traumatic stress. I think the reaction that we all had was wanting to nurture and comfort. Really hear what they're saying and you continue showing them love patience and kindness, they in turn can show that to themselves and to others. And I think the first part of healing is when they show that to themselves. The one thing that was so amazing was they were there for me through everything in such an incredible way and I've never, I'll never forget it. Just to be there, just to provide him with support, uh, to let him know that we loved him, to allow him to, uh, to understand that no matter what it was, no matter what he had ever done, no matter what he ever did, uh, we were there. That kind of support kept me alive, you know, 
it kept me, it healed me. If I was to change something, I would really go back and um, take that help that people were offering because I think it's, it would have been a lot better for me and a lot better. It would make the people feel like they were part of what was going on. There was an old uh, saying I saw on a bumper sticker, said, hugs, not drugs. And I think that's true that uh, some people, they go to a psychiatrist and they just give them a bottle of pills. And uh, what they really need, I think, is somebody who, like, give them a hug and treat them with kindness. Uh, you know, well, this advice to all the people who have a, a loved one who might have post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, kindness uh, is a very good medicine because uh, that's uh, something that uh, is missing in people's life. My face was so swollen I couldn't open my eyes. One morning I heard the shuffling of feet and as I began to just crack my eyes open I heard, Natasha, it appears that the enemy has made yet another failed attempt to neutralize you. <laughs> For the first time in weeks, I smiled. In an instant, I went from devastation to power. Involuntarily, I was thrust into my character of Natasha, feeling as if I just saved the world, proud to be an agent in service to my country. It was a badge of honor to lay bloody and swollen. Amazing. And as Boris would say, it is the power of the mind. Wotan's shadow. I am the breath of your life. I am the hardened god, the host of the wild hunt. I am the fury of the warrior in the storm of conflict. I am the kiss of the thin-lipped axe. I am the spark of the poet. The vast knowledge of the wanderer. The compassion of the healer. The infinite forgiveness of the creator. And the icy blade of the destroyer. I am your companion throughout. Find me beyond the shattered pieces of your broken heart. I am your reality and I never cease. I am your shadow whom you call death. I am everything that you're running from. I am the up and the down. The lonesome path through to your freedom. I have cut you down so you may grow stronger each time you re-emerge. I am your passion, the awesome joy of your existence. I am everything within, trying to break free. And Paralympic champion, the United States of America. I am your transformer and I will teach you everything. I have hardened you. I have brought you wisdom and strength. Your honor is your sole responsibility. I am your blood and your soil, the wild god of your ancestors and your fierce protector. I care for you, warrior. I am with you. I am everything. I am now. I dare you to live. Once you realize you see the light, your pace quickens, your heart races, and you're finally out the other side. And truly, you have grown. Keep moving forward. Never look back. The only thing behind you is the traumatic events. Always face towards the future and to the light. Put yourself there. Be, be there with him. You think he needs you, just show up. Hey, how are you doing? What's going on? How's things going? You know, simple reactions, simple things, but very important to them. 
because they gain that feeling of belonging again. I think anyone can be there for, for another person. Anyone can. Be grateful. Cultivate gratitude in your heart. I stopped looking at what I don't have and I started looking at what I do have and I think that helped me a lot. It's all about, it's a process of integration really. Express yourself, express your feelings creatively, exercise and find something that you feel passionate about. Those three things. You know, I could sit here and give a list of, of so many very valuable modalities and techniques and therapies, but without love, love, love propels all these practical disciplines into like miraculous results. Everything falls a little flat without it. That was the element that to this day, I feel it, I know it in my bones. It took me to my complete transformation. I want to talk about little victories. Little victories are things you could do for yourself to put yourself in a better state of mind. They're small rewards. Taking yourself to the park, a nice dinner with your grandmother. Understanding little victories and the impact they have on you will help you on your first step to recovery. The great news is things can actually be better than they ever been for you. You can come out of this. You can grow stronger. And we're never alone. There's so many people who've been through trauma in their life, whether it's through war or through abuse, or there's stories out there. And if you hear other people's stories, you know you're not alone. A lot of things come to mind, you know, but life, you know, it's like it's a deck of cards, you know, the, the, the hand that you get dealt. You know, what you do with it is up to you. You can choose to you know, be a victim of life or you can choose to be an advocate of life and go change your circumstances. And uh, you know, life is what you make of it. And so I took that and you know, so as to not disappoint Pops, just move forward and you know, I hope I haven't disappointed him at this point. A little mental trick that I've taught myself is to distract myself mentally. I'll try to find something to, to uh, totally distract my mind, start thinking about something else, so to speak. But can't just start thinking about something else. You have to kind of actively do something like, I think I'll go change the oil on my car. And then I'm thinking about that while I'm doing that. So I think just getting up and even if it hurts and you don't want to do it and you have, you have to just face your fears and, and just do it. And it's, it's might be hard at first, but it gets easier. And then it becomes just like clockwork. It just starts happening. Resolve to make a difference in your life. Thank you.